The sermon text this morning is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 4 through 17. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, and the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to, to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. And the name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Abdelium and onyx stone are there. And the name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work in and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. I think most of us can, um, we can have times of feeling kind of overwhelmed by the tragedies and the difficulties that we have in life. We think about even Ukraine right now and the suffering that is going on there, the difficulties that these people are facing. It breaks our heart and um, it can dampen our hopes, really. It can lead some to discouragement and even some to despair and, and even to disbelief. You know, it, it's hard sometimes to, to reconcile the goodness of God in creation and yet then to see life that is filled with difficulties and trials and hardships. I think this is exactly what Moses is trying to do here. I think he's trying to help reconcile this idea of a good God who makes a good creation. And yet he's preaching to people who have been in slavery for generations. They've been enslaved. They've been dehumanized. And after he speaks in Genesis 1 to the goodness of God and creation, they had to be thinking, well, what about all the issues we have here? I mean, why are we having so much problems? Why, why have we been in slavery? What about the nature of our troubled marriages and struggling raising children and, and, and conflict in our friendships and relationships and, and murder and strife? How does that work with a good God? I, I think the, the conflict is really speaking to our experience that we have today. It's how do we reconcile these two things? And so here Moses begins speaking about the origins of creation, but he's quickly moving to the origins of trouble and the trials that we face. In fact, in, verse, in chapters 2 through 4, it's really the beginning of Moses trying to help us understand. Remember, he's not trying to prove the existence of God. He's trying to introduce us to God so that we can understand him. And we have to understand God in the context in which we live, which is this is a troubled world. And so in chapter 2, in chapter 1, it was this, this creation of the cosmos, right? This 10,000-foot view on how he makes things. And chapter 2 is more of a creation of the family. And chapter 2 is essential to understand if you're going to understand chapter 3, which is explaining why we have the problems that we have. And that's why you see in verse 4, these are the generations of... In Hebrew, it's like saying, here is the family history. This is what's coming. And he's going to launch into, I've created this world, and I've created the human family, and here's how you're to thrive and live before God. Now, remember, Moses is writing to a people that understand the fall, just like we, just like we understand that. But, but he's speaking, this is how God did it. And we need to understand this so that in two weeks when we look at the fall, we can understand why we have what we have. 
So let's look at how God has created men and women to live before him. There are three operative ideas for you. Three. One will be he's created us to live in dependence. Not independence, but in a dependence before him. Humility. That, that's the first. He has created us by design to live that way. Secondly, he has created us to live in fellowship with him. This is his intention. He wants to be with his creation. So to be in fellowship. And then thirdly, he's created us to, to live in service to him, that we're going to serve him. And we'll explain more of that in just a minute. So those three kind of operative ideas, first that he's created us to live before him in a dependence. So look with me back at five to seven. Daniel read, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, no small plant was in the field, it yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. There was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land, and it was watering the whole face of the earth, and the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So, so Moses is just setting up the condition of the world. What's the setting for the making of man? Right? There's no, there's no bush, there's no shrub, there's no rain. This is like the earth untended. It's not flourishing. Why isn't it flourishing? Well, because there's no man to tend it, to, to take care of it, to steward it. In other words, God has created his creation to be stewarded by his creation. So he has made all these things, and he, and he needs a king to be there to fill and subdue. And that's what he does. He creates this man. But, but notice how he creates the man. He forms him out of dust, dust of the ground, just dust of the ground. We're not made of titanium. We're not made of some form of steel or precious metals. You know, Matthew Henry writes, we're not made of gold dust or pearl powder. We're just made of dirt. Hey, these humble beginnings, the evolutionists will tell you that we've descended from apes or dolphins. It's not that good. It's not that good. You're not. You're dirt. I mean, we are, in fact, we're dust of the dirt. That's what we are. It's, it's, Moses is driving us to understand the humble origins from which we've come. We are dust. But there's something glorious about dust when God takes it. And so he takes it and he forms man. And when he forms it, that, that, the Hebrew word for form means to, to really artistically create, intentionally. And man's not an accident. And he's not some random event. He's not some byproduct of some other issues. It, it's God formed man. God made man. He made man. He made them not like the animals. In fact, you see the Lord God formed the man. Now, Elohim was the name of God used 35 times in chapter 1. In chapter 2, we are the, for the first time meeting God by his personal name, Yahweh. Yahweh, the Lord God made man. So the personalness of God is directly involved in the creation of man. That incredible that God uses his own personal name to create us in tenderness. And then notice what he does. He comes to man and he breathes life into him. Derek Kidner, a great Old Testament scholar, says, breathed is the warming personal face-to-face -face intimacy of a kiss and the significance that this was an act of giving as well as making and self-giving at that. You know, in a way, it's like, Prince Charming coming to Snow White and kissing her and giving her life. God breathes into us, translating to us his nature, his, his moral and relational, all the capacities that we have that are different from the animal world. We have those communicated to us. Now, I don't think a lot of people want to just see masculinity here. And I do think we see masculinity here, but we see masculinity and femininity here. Because in Job 10, 8 and 9, Job uses the exact same language in the creation of all people. That God breathes life, that we're all formed by dust. And God brings, and, and what you see then, because when Job speaks to it, he's speaking about all creation. So this is historical in my mind. This happened. But it's also a meta-history. It's also a historical event that cast its shadow over all of history. 
Just like in Psalm 139, he saw our unformed substances and he formed us. Each one of us here has been made from dust. It, it, one author made it, it kind of made it analogous to a light bulb. I don't know if this will help you or not. It helped me a little bit. But, you know, think of a light bulb. It's just glass and wire, pretty common elements. But then you infuse electricity in there, and boom, light is formed out of it. God takes common elements, but he breathes his life in it, and things change. So, so you see here that he's intending for us to understand that how do we live before God? In, well, we live in a dependence before him. What's this mean? Well, it means that you and I ought to at least be grateful to the life that we have, grateful to God for the life we have. We ought to be thankful to him that we have. Like last week I asked you, consider your moral, relational, your rational, your spiritual capacities. You have the ability to reason and to argue and to debate and to progress. No, nothing else does in creation. You have the ability to make moral evaluations. You can make judgments of right and wrong. You have that understanding that's been given to you. And you used it this week. Were you grateful for it? You have relational capacities. You don't have to relate in instinctual ways, but you can relate with love, with hate. You have all these different forms and methods with which and, and feelings with which to relate to people. Have you enjoyed God for these things? Have you thanked him? Have you thanked him for the life you have? You know, one way, oftentimes I find we're thankful in our minds, but we don't express it to anyone. You know, you, oftentimes you'll people, they'll say, I meant to tell you this. And, then, and you think, well, unless I ran into them, they might not have told me. We need to express our thankfulness to God. We need to give word to it. In fact, I think it increases our enjoyment of things when we express it. So when you're before a nice meal, God, thank you for this food. Not some form, you know, kind of a prayer of blessing by rote that you do over and over. This, we don't actually need to bless the food. The food's already been blessed because it's been given to us by God. Uh, but we want to thank him. God, thank you for the variety, the taste, the beauty. Thank you that you're sustaining my life. I live in dependence upon you. The food's a reminder. I can't live without food. Every time you sit down, you're declaring to God, I know I'm dependent. I got to eat. Nobody can walk away from the table without eating over and over and over and think they're going to live. You declare your independence. You declare your dependence when you eat. But to give them thanks, when you get up in the morning and your eyes open, one day they won't. So, I mean, we thank them for that. God, thank you for the life that I have. And, e and even when we're suffering, we can still give thanks. Why? Because it says in Psalm 103 that he knows our frame. He knows that we are but dust. He knows we're but dust. So, so if you are suffering, run to him and, and, and tell him, you know I'm dust. I'm struggling. I, I mean, I'll, I'll sometimes just stop and say, God, you know my frame. You know I'm dependent. Strengthen me. Strengthen me, God. you, you got to give me what I need. And that's what we can do because he knows our frame. But not just do we live in dependence on God and give him thanks for the life, but we do want to walk in humility. Our dependence is by divine design. God intended it this way. Uh, God has made, why else would there be a tree of life? We need the life to come to us by God. It's a reminder of our dependence. This should lead to humility. Nobody here is self-determining. Nobody can make yourself an inch higher. You can't change the color of your hair permanently. You can't change the color of your eyes. You can't determine where you're going to be born. You can't determine where you're going to die. You can't add a day to your life. Nobody's self-made. He makes all of us. And he sustains all of us. This should be clear to us. It should, it should drive us to a humility that would benefit our marriages, our friendships, our relationships at work. John Calvin said it in his own way. He says, the body of Adam is formed of clay and destitute of sense. To that end, no one should exalt beyond measure in his flesh. I love this part. 
He must be excessively stupid who does not learn humility. There is wisdom in humility. Our, our culture has caused us, or at least tried to cause us, to think of humility as a weakness. Humility is wisdom. It's recognizing from where we've come. Listen to what Job says. If it were his intention and he withdrew his spirit and breath, all mankind would perish together and man would return to the dust. Do you, do you think of yourself in this way? Does this, can you not see this leading to great humility? I mean, think about it, that we are dust. So when we live before God, we want to live thankful for the life we have, but humble for the fact that it's a given life to us. But we want to live aware of our own dustness. We're going to see in chapter 319 that we're going to return to dust. You know, there is no tree of life for us to go to. There's no fountain of youth that you'll discover. We are dust. Do you realize when David wrote Psalm 23 and he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Do you realize the, the valley of the shadow of death, that isn't a place that you go to when you receive a diagnosis that you have stage four cancer. We are born in a valley of death. We live in this valley of death and will die in the valley of death. That is the whole point. This shadow of death casts its kind of pall over all of us because we're all made of dust. That's why the great Kansas song in 1977, Dust in the Wind, we're, that's all we are. We're dust in the wind. Go, go get the lyrics on it. It's beautiful. I mean, it's really, it's eye-opening. We're just dust in the wind. Glorious. Because God made us and formed us and breathed his life into us. But we're yet dust. Maybe this should lead you to repentance. Maybe you have taken great courage and confidence and joy over what you've made of yourself. And I, I don't want to discourage efforts at growth and godliness and holiness. But maybe we should be repenting of, God, forgive me for living every day and never thanking you for the breath I have or the life that I have, or the gifts that I have, or the capacities that I have, or the relationships that I have, or the food they give me. You know, when we grasp that we're creatures, it's going to change your paradigm of living. It really will. It'll bring humility, a sensitivity, a recognition of the brevity. You will be wiser. You know, he says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You gain wisdom when you know you're going and your life is of a temporal nature on this earth. So that's the first thing we see, is that we are called to live in dependence before God. But look at, secondly, we're called to live in fellowship with God. Now this is in really 8 to 14, uh, this garden language. Let me just read 8 and 9 for you. And the Lord God planted a, a garden in Eden in the east. There he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is really incredible here. You know, here he's talking about the glory of this garden. Now, I don't think it's a mythological garden. I think it's an actual garden. It's a literal garden, right? We've got these two rivers. We've got four rivers, actually, but two that we know of, the Tigris and Euphrates. The other two we don't know where they are. And this garden is where it is. It's a mystery. Now, you can't imagine how many preachers want to try to tell you where they think it is. It's somewhere in the corner of Iraq or over here in Palestine. I, I don't know where it is. It's a mystery. It, it's like the mystery, you know, where'd the ark rest? Well, we now know it's in Kentucky, but before then, we didn't know where it was. <laughs> there, there are some mysteries. There are some mysteries that we just have to accept. It doesn't deny the literal beauty of this garden. What I want you to see is this garden is incredible. I mean, God gives of every living tree. It's good for the sight. It's good for our bodies. I mean, note the generosity of God. Remember how I said last week, or two weeks ago, that these Mesopotamian deities and religions, the humanity was always bringing food to them. But, but notice what God does. He makes all the trees for us. He's serving us. He wants us happy. He wants us to be well cared for. Every tree. I mean, you think about the beautiful trees. You think about the perfuming trees. You think about the beautiful 
the, the gold, the bedillion, the onyx. You, you, you see precious metals. This creation is incredible. And he's made it all. He hasn't done it in Spartan fashion. He hasn't done it in a way where these are your necessities and this is what you're going to get. He goes well over, above, well above and beyond. I mean, you, you look at the generosity of God just in the types of birds. I mean, you can, he could create a couple of birds and, yeah, God can make a bird. Look at all the birds that he makes, the trees, all the creatures. I mean, it's all. And then it's like a paradise fit for a king. And then he puts man in it. He puts a king in it. He puts a queen in it. This is the incredible nature of God. He wants to have fellowship with us. He wants us to enjoy him. He wants to enjoy us. This idea of, you know, chapter 3, Adam and Eve, they walk in the cool of the day with God. You know, God has intended to be with his creation. He has made the creation. He put man in it. Now, it's interesting Two different Hebrew words in verse 8 for, for put and in verse 15 for put. And, and, and the word in 15 kind of gives us a fuller understanding. The word to put means to rest. It's the same word for rest. So in, on day 7, when God created all things, or he stopped on day 6, he rested on day 7. And that day has no morning or evening. It's an eternal day. So it goes on forever because God wants to, he will rest forever, enjoy his creation. He has put or rested us there so we can enjoy him. I mean, is that incredible to enjoy? God wants to be with us. And, and we know, and now we're post-fall, right? We're here. We're not in a garden like that. We're in this world, this chaotic world, this disordered world. But let me show you that God had always wanted this and he's going to have his way. Right? So you see in the garden, he creates this perfect rest. And then, of course, we sin against him. We're removed from the garden. But that doesn't stop God from achieving what he wants. He wants to be with us in a rest. So you see the formation of the tabernacle. God gives Moses the pattern of how a tabernacle is formed. And when you read the details of the tabernacle, you're going to see things like Bedelian and Onyx. And you're going to see the same things from the garden that's in the tabernacle. God's not with us. We cannot be with him as we were because of our sin, but he still comes to us. And that tabernacle becomes a temple, a permanent place where we get to meet with God, worship, enjoy God. But, but it, it gets so sweeter because then Jesus Christ comes. And what does he do? Remember how John said that in the beginning was the word? So Jesus was in the beginning. And then, of course, Jesus in 114 that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, uh, John was written in Greek, but, but the Hebrew word for that word is he tabernacled among us. That wasn't by accident. He tabernacled, reminding us God's drawing even closer to us to have fellowship with us. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh now coming among his people because he wants to be with us. He wants us to enjoy him. He wants us to rest in him, even in the chaos of this world. And then you're not going to be surprised that in Revelation 22, there's another garden we're going to end up in. And the garden has, not shocking, I'm sure, a tree of life. And that's where God says it's done. Rest. So do you see what God's intending to do with us? He created us for himself, that we would enjoy him and he would enjoy us. So when you look at this creation, we want to pay attention to it because he's drawing us to himself even now outside of Eden. We're post-Eden people and we're pre-New Eden people. But now as we live in this difficult time, he gives us a creation that though fallen still is marked with his beauty and his power and his majesty. We can look at creation. We can look at the foods we eat, the places we go, the trees, the relationships we have. We can still see his glory and power. In fact, you know, if you ever realize, you know, sunrises and sunsets, something simple as those. Read one blogger how they don't happen instantaneously, and she was just making the comment of how, how good that is. They, you know, the sun could come up in a moment, it could go down in a moment, and, and that would be it. But, but he does it slowly. You know, whenever I go to the beach, you guys know, because I've told you a hundred times, but um, I always get up and watch the sunrise. I love the sunrise. And when you're on the beach watching the sunrise, particularly when it comes up out of the water, I know it doesn't come out of the water, but it looks like it. 
people are walking on the beach and most of them will stop. And they just, at that point, you know, where it's slowly coming up, they stop and look at it. They're not Christians. They're not worshiping in, in the sense of I understand worship, but they are. They're, they're seeing the glory of what God has done. When we're on the west coast of Florida, Karen and I, a number of years back, and we're at this restaurant, and the tables are in the sand, the sand's looking across the Gulf of Mexico west, and of course, the sun's going down. And it's like a hush. And the restaurant had 150 people in it, and, and there's like a hush that comes on the people. They say, and they're looking at it. Because look what God's done. They're not attributing thankfulness to God for what he's done, but they're still being marked by the incredible nature of all that God has done. They just don't have the wisdom to know who to give thanks for it. So, so we see creation has been given to us. God, God has given us this that we would enjoy him because that is a reflection of his glory and his power. The heavens declare the glory of God. And Jesus said, consider the birds, Consider the lilies. Jesus directs us to it to remind us of our Heavenly Father, one who knows us, loves us, and cares for us. But not only pay attention to creation. In fact, I would encourage you to go to science. Go into science as a Christian. Uh, but not just that. This creation points to another creation, a new creation that's coming. So in other words, we're post eden now, right? So, so we're now called to be looking for the new heavens and the new earth. We're to be hungering for these things. We're not just looking to be delivered out of the problems of this world. No, we want to be with God. This is, a, this is a heartbreak for me, and this is kind of an instructional point, perhaps for some of us. As we get older, it's not just escaping the pains of the physical burdens of this life. That is a benefit to going from this life to be with God. The draw to being with God is not great weather. It's not a body that you can do handsprings and somersaults on. It's being with God, enjoying him in his fullness without the stain of guilt and sin and shame that we have. It's enjoying God forever. And this is why Jonathan Edwards would say, you need to be conversant with heaven. You need to be thinking about it. To what degree do you hunger for this? Is heaven for you just a form of escapism out of wherever you are? Or is it a draw to one of you with the one who has formed me and face to face he kissed me with life? Are we hungering for this God? Jared Tolkien writes, we all long for Eden and we're constantly glimpsing it. Our whole nature at its best and least corrupted. It's gentlest and most human. It's still soaked with a sense of exile. We know we're not home. That's the rumblings that I was talking about two weeks ago. There's something haunted in us. We know there's something more. And he's calling us to long for it. To be with him. So, so why is our fellowship so dry? You know, when you read your Bible or you pray and God seems so far away, why is that? When I ask people that, you know, sometimes I'll hear, well, if he was just closer, if I could see him or if I could hear him, you know, then it'd be different. I'd really be close to him. And I'd really feel and sense and enjoy his presence. If he just came down, friends, he did. He did come down. And by God's grace, we have a record of all that he said and did. And we get to see this Jesus, Emmanuel. This is the glory of the incarnation, God with us now. We hear him speak. We hear him care for the brokenhearted, rebuke the religious self-righteous. We see him raise the dead, give sight to the blind, give speech to the mute. We see him. This is why we're students of the word. Who is this God? Jesus is exact representation of the Father. Let me re-encourage you. You know, those dry, they, they, there are dry times. We are in bodies of flesh. We're in a post-Eden existence. You know, when we see him, we're going to be, we're going to be like him. It's going to be different, no doubt. But in the meanwhile, these scriptures are like a rope. It's like a communication with God. We can still talk to him and enjoy him. Receive his promises and encouragement to live. He's created us to have fellowship with him. That's the day that's coming for us. And then last, he's created us to serve him. He's created us to serve him. Look with me at 15 to 17. 
He says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Uh, so, so here we have uh, the man is put in the garden to work it and keep it. Now, I would see the working and keeping not simply to be a, a masculine response. I do think it's that, uh, perhaps even primarily, but I see it as a fulfillment of the fill and subdue, the command given to both male and female. So this idea of working and keeping the garden, to work the garden uh, does mean, you know, farming, tilling, cultivating the land. And I think it means that because we're going to see in chapter 3 how working the ground now is going to cause the sweat on the brow. But, but it's more than working the, it's more than just cultivating the ground. That word for work is used of the priestly service in the tabernacle. And so you see this kind of conflation of ideas. It's both the labor that we do in life, but it's also the act of service to God. So when he says work the garden, he's speaking to all of us, men, women, whatever you do, wherever you work, you are working with the gifts of God in the creation of God for the glory of God. This transforms or should transform your view of work. The struggle that we have of forming identities from what we do or how well we've done it, that God has given to us to work it, but not just work it, but to keep it. Now, the word for keep means to guard, means to protect. And you see that, of course, in light of chapter 3, when they did not protect the garden. But let me remind you that the word to keep isn't just to guard, it's to obey, like to keep the commands, which, surprisingly, immediately follow, right? In verses 16 and 17, you see two commands given. The first two commands in Scripture. So when he says, keep the garden, he's really saying to obey God, that part of our service to God is obedience to the Word of God. You know that because they didn't obey the commands, and they were removed from the garden. They didn't keep it. It wasn't protected. It was overrun. When the enemy came, they weren't there. They didn't obey they lost. So this idea, he gives two commands. Notice one's positive and one's negative. One's positive. He says, from all of these trees you may eat. I mean, that, that is, don't, don't move over that too quick. From all the trees you can eat, they're all beautiful to look at, and they're all good for you. The one tree you can't. Now, now you think, it's like, we should stop and just consider it. So if, if, you, if you went to a car dealership and the owner of the dealership came up and said, hey, listen, I got 10,000 cars on this lot. You pick any one you want. This one over here, I'm going to keep that one. You pick any one you want. Are you going to say, I can't believe that. I'm going to another car dealership. I mean, what's the deal? I can't even have that car. You got 10,000 cars over here? I want that car. Do you see what he's saying? God is showing us two things. He's showing us his generosity. You can eat from anything. The kindness of God. Any car you want. I mean, don't miss the, the kindness of God. Now, the, the one tree, the introduction of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, it, it's there for a purpose. It, it's to show us the severity of failing to obey God. It, it, it's showing us... Th that we invite disaster when we knowingly exercise moral autonomy away from God. It's to invite disaster, problems. It's to bring chaos into a world that now has been rightly ordered. And I tell you, many of us could stand up here and join me in telling you when I've exercised moral autonomy, I have brought chaos into my life that I still have deep memories of. And it has brought trouble. By God's grace, I stand here forgiven only because of the worth of Christ, but I still remember the chaos that I brought into my life when I exercised moral autonomy away from God. That's all he's saying. These commands are from a good God. They're not, you know, when we think of the commands of God, yeah, I don't want a religion with all kinds of rules. Well, what parent here that has any weight of worth doesn't give both positive and negative instructions? I mean, do we do it because we don't want our children happy? Do we do it because we want to thwart their joy? No, we're, we're giving 
both encouragement to do, but also encouragement to not do those things that will bring about a lack of flourishing. So I want you to see God in these commands as it's gloriously kind. There is going to be the growth in knowledge of good and evil that we will gain, but God wants us to gain it through the ways that he's ordained, not us exercising our own path through the forest. So you see here that we're, we've been created to live in dependence on God. We've been created to live in fellowship with God, and we've been created to live in service to God, and our service is both through our work and our obedience. So you know what this does to us at work? Think about it. I, just a quick theology of work. You know, Paul says, whatever you do, whether you uh, eat or drink, do it for the glory of God. Even the most fundamental things that we do, eating food and drinking water, that's what we all do every day, do it for the glory of God. It can be as we give thanks to God. Or Paul says in Colossians, he says that whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the Father. What he's saying is, whether you're a woman or a man, whether you have a high-flying job or a job that is considered lower on whatever scale you're looking at, you can do it for the glory of God, that he has given us these things, these capacities, he's given us these gifts, these opportunities, and utilize them. So wherever you are working, whether it's in the home or out of the home, that you, you can, your work is worship. It's valuable. You don't want to build an identity on your work. You, 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 don't, you, know how, you know how we do that? You come up to meet somebody, hey, what do you do? We define ourselves often by what we do and not who we are. And God says, no, it's who you are that matters. You've been made my image and my life has been breathed in you. But what it does is it takes all the forms of work that we engage in over the course of our lives, and it makes them all conduits for giving God glory. I, I want to do, if I'm a computer programmer, I want to program well for the glory of God that my clients are served, that my boss is, <laughs> is satisfied that I'm achieving the goals he set or whatever. It, it can be computer, account, it, it can be anything. It could be something menial. You're just building a bench. I want to build this well. So it, it blows apart the sacred secular divide, and it makes all of life worship. And it should be because we're in his creation. We are his people. We are living with his breath. We are using his gifts, and we're taking all the resources that he's created. So, it, so it, you don't go to the office and, well, I got to do business business ways. And I'll be different at home. You're not, no, it's all the same. The way you lead a meeting at the office should be the way you, you speak to your friends at church. I mean, I, I get the differences in certain dynamics, but don't overplay those differences. The kindness and mercy and truthfulness and integrity ought to take place all places. There is no sacred, secular. It's all sacred. But, but also notice that that we are called not just to work for the glory of God, but to, but to obey God. Uh, notice these commands are given before the fall. So God is speaking, and he's giving instructions before the fall. We need God's word to live. Even when they were perfect, they needed the word. And, and so do we need the word. You know, the whole point of the tree is really a test. It's really a test to Adam and Eve. Will you live for my glory? Will you live by faith alone? Will I be, will you be satisfied in me alone or do you need more? Every time we're confronted with moving in our own worldly autonomous ways, we're being confronted with, do I need him or do I need him and something? Oftentimes we choose him and something. You know, Moses is writing here, to prepare us for one to come, a second Adam, basically. We know, each of us here, because we're post-fall, we're post-Eden, we know that we continue to go our own way. You can't go a day. Well, most of us can't. I can't. Let me say, speak for myself. I can't go a day without wanting to be morally autonomous from God and going my own way. I need one to come, a second Adam, who will obey it's interesting when Jesus is confronted by Satan and he says, you know, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus says, it's written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know, the reason that Jesus is called the second Adam is because he came now to represent a new creation, a new kingdom, a new people. 
And he now is the head of this new race of people who come to God by faith in Christ. This is what it means to be a Christian, is you enter a new society through faith in this one who came as a second Adam, who did do everything according to the word of God, who was satisfied in God alone. It's interesting that he chose not to eat, but to obey. Adam will choose to eat and not obey. Jesus is creating a new people, and we enter that by faith. And so for those of you who are here and you're hearing this for the first time, this is how you don't become a Christian because you simply adopt a certain set of propositions that are religious in nature. You become a Christian when you recognize, I want to be morally autonomous from God. I want to eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. I need one to come. Moses is preparing. Remember now, he, he knows where Moses knows who he has, the people, post-fall. He's taking us to see and look for this promise of God that will send another one, a perfect one, that we might be redeemed so that we may be brought back into the garden. Moses wants to go back into the garden, but renewed and restored. And this is through faith in Christ. So how do we live before God? People, we're going to leave here. We're going to pursue humility in greater measure because we know that we're but dust. We're going to leave here. We're going to be seeking greater and deeper fellowship with God because that's how he's created us, to enjoy him and for him to enjoy us. And we're going to leave here seeking his glory in all the service that we render, whether it's at work or at home or in the relationship that we have. It's going to be difficult and troubling because of the sin in our lives, but we're going to keep seeing in greater measure as Moses kind of rolls it out for us how we do this for his glory. So let's just take a moment and ask God for wisdom and grace that you might apply this to your soul or even the grace of the Spirit to lead us to conviction and faith in Christ. And I'll pray for us in a moment. Father, your mercy knows no bounds. Please forgive us uh, for believing that you can be stingy and hard-hearted and distant and cold and, and angry at us all the time. Father, would you grant to us the fullness of your spirit that for some they might be led to faith in the one who came the second Adam who came to live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. And, and for those of us who have, who have crawled to a cross for salvation, would you, would you grant to us the grace that we can walk in the freedom, the humility, the freedom that that brings and the benefit to our relationships to recognize the brevity of our lives, that we are like the grass. We're here today and we're gone tomorrow, but your word will abide forever and and give us joy in that, grant to us sweet and fellowship, recognizing that even though we may struggle and fight for times of sweetness in our reading of scriptures and prayer, that one day we will see you face to face, you the one who would breathe life into us, and that we would even in these, just this coming week, Lord, if you give us this week to finish, that we would have lived working and keeping all that you have entrusted to us for your glory and, and, and with an eye to serve others, to serve you. Father, may it be so in our lives this week. We pray in the name of Jesus.